Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Each week we talk about heart rate variability and how it can be used to improve your overall health and wellness. Please consider the information in this podcast for your informational use and not medical advice. Please see your medical provider to apply any of the strategies outlined in this episode. Heart Rate Variability Podcast is a production of Optimal LLC and Optimal HRV. Check us out at OptimalHRV.com. Please enjoy the show. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I am not alone today. Uh, I know I've uh, launched the series off uh, with the last uh, several episodes, uh, but now I got my co-authors, uh, Dave and Ema here, which I'm I'm really excited uh, to talk about chapter one of our book. So uh, uh, hopefully, if you're uh, new to the podcast, we are running a series here. So you can easily find episode one uh, where we sort of introduce the book. Also, if you're new to the podcast, we are releasing chapters um, of our audiobook version of the, the heartbeat of business um, uh, free as part of looking at 2023 as the year of, of recovery and resiliency. So really, we, we know so many people, and I know a lot of people, and I'm, I'm really excited to bring Dave and Ian into this conversation as well. A lot of people are really tired right now, or, or maybe there's this low grade of anger that they're feeling or frustration they're feeling, that, that just what we've been through is you know, human beings is a pandemic of a political environment, uh, war, all these things going on in our world has really taken a toll on a lot of us. So, you know, I know in my work, working with uh, staff resiliency, self-care, a lot of people are, are just really struggling from that being a crisis for them to just kind of this low-grade exhaustion or frustration that people are feeling. And we want to know, hey, if you're doing good, one, congratulations. Uh, so thinking about it from a resiliency perspective, how can we use the science of the autonomic nervous system, the brain, uh, heart rate variability to really uh, take some struggles that we've been through, hardships we've been through, and really transform that again. I love the term post-traumatic growth. Even if you don't look back in the last few years as a trauma for you, how do we transform stress, hardship, struggles into wisdom, resiliency moving forward in our lives? So hopefully that hits pretty much everybody. Like I said, if you if you feel like you're struggling now, please know you're not alone. I know the three of us have had our own struggles uh, with, with everything going on in the world too. So um, uh, welcome uh, to the club. Welcome, Dave and Ina. Uh, with this. And, and Ina, I want to start out with uh, throwing a question to you, because one of the topics um, in chapter one that we started to cover was the idea of homeostasis and how the relationship between homeostasis, uh, stress, and heart rate variability. So I, I sort of want to throw out, I know it's not a simple question here, but, but sort of throw out uh, to get us started about the connection what happens to us with homeostasis through a time of relatively in, uh, intense and constant stress? So I, I will throw that, uh, not a softball question to start out with, but throw that out to you uh, with this idea of homeostasis stress um, and living through the times that we have. That's a great question. And, you know, Matt, I think none of your questions are ever a softball. <laughs> They're all good questions. Um, so the, the idea of homeostasis is uh, our ability to um, return to this kind of, you know, neutral state, this neutral internal um, environment that's uh, ideal for, um, you know, when we are at rest, when everything is functioning kind of the way it's supposed to. And homeostasis gets disrupted by all sorts of things, uh, you know, from, um, you know, internal uh, stuff, uh, you know, like you've had a little you know, too much to eat, and you know that disrupt, disrupts your internal hemostasis. To all sorts of external stuff coming at us, um, and our ability to 
rise to the challenge is important, uh, but perhaps even more important is the ability to return to homeostasis, return and recover, you know, from that challenge. Uh, and the reason that's so important is not just for us to be able to rest, but it also goes a very long way towards us being able to rise to the next challenge, because we're, if we're not able to return to homeostasis in between uh, stressors, in between stuff that happens to us, then, you know, over time, uh, we burn out, we have a lot more trouble uh, dealing with stress and with challenges. So this ability to return to homeostasis is incredibly important. Um, and um, heart rate variability uh, is indicative uh, of our uh, ability to return to homeostasis. When our heart rate variability is high, uh, that uh, tells us that our bodies are able to regulate themselves better. Um, and self-regulation means uh, ability to activate as needed and return to that baseline to that homeostatic state. So HRV is incredibly important in this process. Excellent. You know, th that like returning uh, piece, I, I think, especially when we're under pretty much just constant stress from our world. And I think a lot of our jobs have been turned upside down. Family lives have been turned upside down. There's been a lot of traumas that have happened to people. Some just that may have happened anyway throughout life over the course of three or four years, but obviously pandemic, political unrest, all this other things going on, just, just that real challenge to that consistently over time, which I think distinguishes the, the last several years from, you know, most times, not, not that an individual might not go through that, but this collective experience um, of stress and trauma. Dave, I got to ask you, how, how do you see this all showing up in your office? Because, you know, and I, not being a chiropractor, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that you may just say, man, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. But I imagine a lot of people come to you as, hey, I, I felt good and then I screwed up my back. Get, get me back in some ways to at least a physical homeostasis of, of feeling good again. And, and I just kind of Wonder is, uh, you know, and I know as, as uh, learning from you what chiropractic care is, it's way more holistic than, hey, can you pop my back into place again? Um, I just kind of wonder what you're seeing in your office, in your 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 exam room. You know, what, what are you seeing as far as patients coming in? Well, uh, great question, Anna, and First, uh, first of all, you know, um, as we say to any patient at any time in life, right? Uh, you know, especially these last couple of years. But, you know, I people always have these, uh, you know, injuries uh, that just pop up out of nowhere, right? Uh, you know, and um, and we always like to say there was, it was never, a, you know, just it just happened. Uh, you know, there's that's never the case. It is always. It is always a little bit piling on, a little bit piling on, a little bit piling on until we have, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. And in, in some cases, quite literally, right? Um, so, uh, you know, and when we talk about- Literally, like Dave, I think you would be treating a camel with a back injury. I'm not sure if literally- <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. I, I, maybe, I, maybe I'm misinterpreting chiropractic care. <laughs> But just, just, you know, you throw literally out there. I, I see a camel walking into your office with a back problem. <laughs> yes, not not quite that I treat camels, but, uh, but the <laughs> straw that broke somebody's back. Yes, uh, that that was more the uh, the, the literal one there. Um, there you, you know, so it is. Um, uh, so, you know, it's never it's it's rarely just, you know, oh, my gosh, I just woke up like this one day. Uh, you know, it, it's not just. I just got sick today, which that's another thing that I've been seeing so much of, um, you know, and I'm sure you guys see that out in the world too, is there is so much more illness right now. Uh, you know, I, well, granted I have school, uh, young school age kids. Uh, so they're, you know, like every young school age kid out there picking their nose and, uh, you know, everything goes into their mouth and, uh, you know, so, so illness is constant, but, um, but they're also developing an immune system, right? That's how I like to look at it anyway. But, um, you know, there's a constant illness out there that is, uh, that is just going on. And what, and what is that about? Is that we all have weaker immune systems? Uh, you know, what, what is that? And the, and the answer, you know, is that, well, we're all under a lot more stress, right? So, uh, so if we're all under a lot more stress, 
We know that that brings down our immune system. Uh, we know that that brings down our musculoskeletal system. Uh, we know that we are more prone to injury, right? To these things that just happen, right? We are more prone to illness, uh, you know, these opportunistic uh, bugs that absolutely, if your immune system function is down because you have had cortisol racing for, you know, uh, days, uh, you know, weeks, months, uh, years, um, there, there is a lot more potential that you are getting sick. There's a lot more potential that you are getting injured. So, um, so absolutely we've been, uh, we've been seeing that effect within our office. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think the, the other thing that I see, uh, especially having my own laboratory, which is my, a uh, wife's second grade classroom uh, for a <laughs> yes, biochemical weapon factory. <laughs> um, but, you know, that wearing of masks, which, you know, I, I know from a psychological perspective, this area is really important for communication and social connection. But wow, when you when we took the masks off, all of a sudden there was a lot more of that uh, nose picking and coughing and all the things. <laughs> uh, we just like filled yes. the room with uh, germs that we didn't sort of have exposure to in the same way. And I just see that knock a lot of people, including my wife, uh, for the last couple of weeks out too. So it, it, yes, yeah. It, uh, yeah, that was a uh, you. You bring up a great point there. Uh, the the mask did a wonder as far as keeping nose, uh, as far as yes. keeping fingers out of noses and boogers on everything. <laughs> Re remember when we like didn't want to touch our faces, and I know we still should touch our faces, but that that initial weeks of the pandemic when you saw somebody touch their face and you're like, you you just gasp, and you know we're we're back to picking our nose in second grade, so. Uh... <laughs> So, so Ina, following on what Dave said, I, I think one of the, the interesting sections of this chapter that, that we, we don't touch on as much because it's, you know, from, from an organizational perspective, it may not be when we talk about social, emotional, cognitive health, really those three components are so important to business success. Uh, and we're going to, those are going to be themes uh, throughout the chapters that you listen to in our conversation, social, emotional, cognitive health, how heart rate variability helps to track that, you know, the importance of that for, for business success. The, the one piece that we kind of knock out and having written this section, it's like, okay, we got to talk about this, but it's not really going to be a huge thing throughout the book. But the idea of medical health and one of the things from, uh, you know, as, as you and I being a little bit more in, on the psychological side of things, I would love to hear out of your mouth and with your wisdom kind of following up on what Dave said about as stress starts to impact our autonomic nervous system, how that really manifests into long term health issues because obviously if you can't show up to work because you're always sick or you have a chronic illness you're not going to perform at your best either so i i don't want to skip over this even though it's not going to be a theme of just sort of how you see folks under intense uh chronic stress why do we then see a range of health issues evolve from this disruption of the uh, autonomic nervous system yeah, absolutely right. This is a really important topic. Um, and one that on the one hand, people are sort of aware of, we all kind of know that chronic stress is not so good for us. No. Uh, but, you know, it also does get kind of brushed away because the effects really are quite long term. It's not like, you know, you pick your nose today, you're sick tomorrow. Um, it, it, this is this happens over over, over years. Um, and I want to say that not to alarm people. And, you know, if you've been stressed for years, that's it. End of the world. No, uh, there is a lot you can do about it, which is why we're talking about this, which is why, you know, heart variability by feedback exists. There is a whole lot you can do to uh, to improve from here on. But it's also important to pause now and think about it. You know, how have you been treating yourself over the last you know, bunch of years um, and think about what effect that might have uh, for the future is now a time to think about it. So um, ultimately, um, what chronic stress uh, does is it 
a little by little over time, it damages our ability to return to homeostasis. Um, our bodies are built for responding to stress. So for each individual uh, stressor, the fact that your body activates and you know your heart, rate, uh, heart beats faster and your breathing is faster and your gastrointestinal system is doing something, uh, you know, all of that is okay. Your body is built for it. Um, the problem starts coming when those stressors are uh, too intense, too frequent, without adequate time to recover. Uh, so each time the stressor comes without the ability to recover properly, the nervous system gets a little more fatigued, a little bit more depleted. Um, and uh, over time, it, it gets dysregulated. So over time, the ability of the nervous system to uh, respond uh, to changes in your internal or external environment uh, gets weaker and weaker. Um, and what underlies a lot of our chronic health conditions is ultimately a dysregulated autonomic nervous system. You know, yes, all it manifests in all sorts of different ways and there are uh, different kinds of, you know, illnesses and uh, conditions and syndromes, et cetera, you know, from things like chronic pain to high blood pressure to uh, irritable bowel syndrome and all of these. Um, and they manifest differently, but the foundation for all of it is a dysregulated autonomic nervous system. Um, and Ultimately, that's the connection. Uh, when we don't pay attention to our ability to return to homeostasis, giving ourselves sufficient time to recover, um, we predispose ourselves, you know, for conditions like that to develop over time. Yeah, and Dave, I think that brings us to uh, uh, such an important topic of inflammation. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that there's that dysregulation. Um, cytokines is something I've been fascinated with. And I think especially with long haul COVID, you know, we see this escalated, you know, level of cytokines and we see that with chronic stress as well. So I would love for you to, to follow up on what Ina said with well, what, you know, that dysregulation leading to inflammation uh, is such a key thing because that, that also gives us that bridge to the social, emotional, cognitive functioning as well. But I'd love to just kind of hear your thoughts, uh, you know, kind of from the, the body perspective of what, what that inflammation is, is and what it's doing to our system. Well, well, absolutely. When we look at, uh, when we look at inflammation in general, we know that that is, uh, that is, part of it is is the root cause of it you know in a lot of cases of i uh, of what we look at as as pain discomfort it's uh you know it's what we look at a uh you know a cause for illness a cause for breakdown of our body um so so when we are under long-term stress we aren't sufficiently handling uh handling that right we uh we see a buildup of inflammation and we see these things causing uh causing long-term problems um so yeah, a, a big question that I always get is, what can I do to decrease inflammation? Um, and uh, you know, and of course, lifestyle factors are uh, are are a huge part in that. Um, but you know, proper recovery uh, is uh, is always going to be uh, you know leading the way. Um, and uh, and you know, you know, I know that uh, you and I will uh, march down this path all day long of which starts with proper breathing and proper sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and going uh and, and going there forth um but yeah uh, it, inflammation is ultimately going to tear apart our body uh weaken uh weaken us in every way and um and we do, will absolutely see that reflected in our hrv as well awesome so so the final topic i wanted to to touch on uh with you both is this idea of the window of tolerance and uh i introduce uh in this section and an analogy that you know has weirdly stuck around for about 13 years in how i talk about stress and trauma usually i need to find a different analogy every three or four months or i get get bored but this one seemed to have a little bit of stickiness um over the years because i think it, it really gives us a way to, to in some ways summarize it is it, whenever you use an analogy, you, you have to sacrifice a little bit of the science to, to talk about something in five minutes that would take, you know, five months to describe. But this idea of this cup analogy with the window of tolerance and really looking at um, that we each have this capacity 
to hold stress. And then next, uh, next chapter, we'll get into states and traits and how important uh, those are uh, when we look at our health and wellness. But with the cup analogy, if, if you listen to the chapter, we know that there's that capacity to hold stress. And then if we have a manageable amount of stress and uh, allostolic load, uh, a good vocab word there, is that we are we are in our executive functioning part of our brain. We are, our, our heart rate variability is probably high, um, heart rate fairly moderated, and we can bring our best selves to our life, whatever that is in front of us, whether that's a workout, whether that's time with family, whether that's a, a hard work project that we have to do. And then as we gain more stress over time, our cup starts to fill up and pushes us out of that sort of optimal zone of functioning into a more stress-based form of functioning. Uh, Daniel Siegel talks about the chaos rigidity. And then if that, that cup overflows, we can go in that fight, flight, or freeze uh, sympathetic uh, or dorsal vagal responses. And so, you know, for me, it's it's just been a great way to share where's your cup at today? Uh, if I have to say, you know, how high is your allostolic load? It's difficult. How are you doing today is one that I think is almost just as worthless because, you know, it's easy to shrug off. And, you know, with my work with folks with trauma, you know, what one of the things that I've learned, it's hard to put our word or our emotions into words. Uh, my wife in second grade works with this with her students with social emotional education. But it's easy to say I'm OK, right, and, and, and go on. But really that reflection on where are you at today within that window of tolerance. And, and you know, I, I just kind of wonder, because you you hook people up to really expensive machines. I, I know with the optimal HRV, we, we give heart rate variability, you know, looking at monthly averages, weekly averages, all this stuff. I sort of, I'm very fascinated with, you know, um, I use the analogy, you use fancy equipment. We, when you think about the window of tolerance as a concept, I'd love to just get your your thinking around uh, this uh, topic. Yeah, uh, first of all, I love your cup analogy. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. It's a really great, great way to explain it's a, it, allostatic load, right? Allostatic load is a fairly complicated uh, concept. And, you know, I teach it, you know, to my students all the time. Um, and I've stolen your analogy at this point and, and I use it, uh, awesome. because it, it just, it just makes, it just makes so much sense. Um, you know, in, in order to be able to take on more, we have to take some things out, mm -hmm. right? Uh, otherwise you can do it both ways. You can't keep everything uh, and keep adding more, you know, at some point the cup will overflow and uh, you, you're going to feel stuck frozen wanting to run away right um you can uh, i think i also sometimes think of the window of tolerance in a slightly different way um when it comes to taking on challenges that you hesitated to take on before uh, and this is where both the allostatic load and the cup analogy and the heart variability will come in here as well but you can think about uh, your window of tolerance almost being kind of like your comfort zone uh, you know and there is this place uh, where you are entirely comfortable and you're doing things you're familiar with and it's not terribly stressful um, and your allostatic load is in just the right place and your cup is you know I don't know two-thirds full whatever it needs to be helpful um, so in just the right place uh, but then you have a big challenge uh, coming up um, and you start thinking oh you know am I ready for this you know let's say uh, you know maybe you're asked to uh, do a really big presentation to you know the CEO of your company that you've never met before uh, and your boss says this will be so good for you this will be great exposure you know this will be great for your career and you go oh my god I'm going to fail um, save me <laughs> Right. Yeah. What 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 am I doing here? Um, a situation like this may be a too big a step out of your window of tolerance, out of that comfort zone. Uh, it may be taking you, you know, taking on so much stress that it, you know, actually overflows, overflows your cup. Um, and your HRV is going to reflect that it's going to decrease and you're going to feel kind of stuck and frozen and overwhelmed. Um, 
And, and it's important to understand that it doesn't mean that you have to immediately say no to something like that, or that you have to power through and do it no matter what. It's not one option or the other. Uh, I think, you know, you can use the idea of the um, of the cup uh, and the idea of the window of tolerance and use your HRV to figure out, well, how do I get there? You know, if this big presentation that's coming up and saying three months is too big a step, uh, well, you know, how can I take a smaller step that takes me out of my comfort zone so that I'm not not growing, right? Because if you only stay in the comfort zone, it's nice, but then you don't grow and your career doesn't grow and your personal life doesn't grow. Right? And, you, and that, that in itself can become stressful. Um, so, you know, you want to take a step out, but taking that giant step is too much. So maybe in those three months before the presentation, you, you know, using the analogy of the cup, uh, you think about, well, how can I add a little bit? Uh, and maybe what things can I take, take off or take out of that plate? And how can I take a small step out of, um, out of that comfort zone, out of that window uh, of tolerance so that I can still tolerate it. So it's a little bit of a challenge, uh, but it, it's enough of a challenge that I can I can deal with it. It's not a threat like that big one. And then you, you know, as you take that small step, your window of tolerance expands, your comfort zone expands, right? This is, you know, you, you do a small presentation to uh, your, perhaps your immediate group, right? Or maybe to people that you know somewhat, et cetera. And then maybe, maybe you take a couple of smaller steps like this and um, by the time your big presentation comes around, your comfort zone has expanded a whole lot. Uh, so the step to get there is actually now quite tolerable. It does not overflow in a cup um, and your window of tolerance is not exploding. Um, and HRV can absolutely guide you through that because your uh, morning readings will tell you, am I taking too big a step um, or you know, am I, uh, am I doing what's, what's actually helpful? Yeah, and I, and I think that that is, you know, when we put this in the organization, whether you're the individual, as you gave with that great example, or whether you're a manager supervising this, that that idea of peak performance, it's, you know, one of the things I, I just get so frustrated with in the business world is the lack of ideal of recovery. Um, and we work with some tech people, right? We 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 see this, and and I know sometimes we're good at this, sometimes maybe not so good at it. But it's like, you know, I I think when your cup is always pretty much at capacity, stepping up for that big presentation or doing a sprint in the tech world, you know, is you just don't have as much sort of in the tank, so to speak, to to be successful at that, and we don't really look at this, I, I'm just fascinated because tech makes great kind of documentaries, like what we, whether it's WeWorks or, you know, uh, uh, the woman that's going to jail or the guy that's going to jail. Everybody goes to jail, gets all, their own Hulu uh, yeah. documentary nowadays. But it's like, well, yeah, of course you were stupid. Of course you put out this with a million mistakes because you were sleeping two hours a night because you were just drinking coffee, Red Bull and donuts for a week straight. <laughs> of course, your, your brain is functioning at 20% of what it was. And then your company tanks or you say something incredibly stupid um, and then you're you're done, you know, and there's just there's just so many examples of this. And yet, you know, and, and Elon Musk is the. Really, because if you got a podcast, you got throwing Musk at least once into the podcast nowadays. It's like, well, you gotta sleep at Twitter. I'm like, why? And they're actually Elon's been studied as one of those people who may only need five hours of sleep a night. That there is like that they, they somebody did a study of these highs. So for Elon, that might be okay, though. If you look at Elon's behavior, I think that's questionable. Now I'm probably banned on Twitter. But, you know, that, that's probably a joy for me right now. But, you know, how many of those people that he's asking to sleep under the desk can perform at a high level and do that as well? Probably research tells us maybe one out of 10, if not two out of 10. So eight out of 10 are going to be performing much below level. So, Dave, I wonder, because I know you work with high performers, both corporate and you know, with your background in athletics as well, how how do you look at this when we, we talk about stress level, knowing, as Ina said, exactly right, we want to push ourselves 
because that's where we grow. But I, I just love to hear how you help people prepare for those, whether it's, again, a sporting event, whether it's a big thing at work, how, how you help people get in that mode of peak performance. Well, you know, I, I loved listening to uh, Ina's explanation there. Uh, and uh, and the great thing is that if you took exactly what Ina said and you applied that to a physical realm, that's exactly what you do for a top level athlete, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is it is no different. Um, you know, you say uh, you, you say you have the the Super well, I guess Super Bowl is a, a very uh, a bad uh, bad representation, but uh, but let's say um, you know for an event that you have coming up mm-hmm. athletically, um, you know, for a high performer, it is the exact same thing. You're going to start with a lot of smaller events. You're going to start with a lot of lower bar events. And work your confidence up, work your level up until you, you know, in, until you are ready there. Um, and and it, it just seems so much more obvious in a physical sense. And that is what, you know, what I love about uh, the book, about uh, Ina's explanation there is that nobody thinks about this in that mental regard. It is always, no, you, you're not overloaded mentally. But it, if I lifted weights this morning, you know, or yesterday, and I'm super sore, I know that I'm not going to lift weights again today. You know, that's just obvious to me. But why is it not obvious that if I stress myself, you know, mentally, uh, that 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 doesn't need a rest as well, that that doesn't deserve recovery? Um, And and uh, and that's what's really cool. uh, You know, when we look at uh, when we look at heart rate variability is that you can see the impact of a stressful event, whether that is physical or whether that is mental, emotional, uh, you know, or work-related, whatever. Um, so that that's the power of it. It is It gives you that objective number of, okay, there may not be any obvious physical sign other than, you know, uh, you're developing an autoimmune disease and you, right. and, and you can't poop and, you know, and uh, <laughs> you can't hold down any food, uh, you know, other than those physical signs, um, you know, there's not that screaming physical pain that, uh, that accompanies it. So that's uh that's what I think is great about HRV in that regard is it does it does help you monitor that. Um and how do I help somebody prepare? Exactly like Ina said. It is um, uh, you know, we we watch that. We watch that heart rate variability. Um, we see a dipping and we want challenges. We want dips in heart rate variability. We want to see that you challenged yourself. We want to see you move that needle. Because if you always stay the same, that means you're not challenging yourself. That means that you're never going outside of your window of tolerance. So we want to see dips in HRV. That is a great thing as long as you recover, right? And we see that recovery and then we're going to challenge you a little bit harder. And then we're going to see that recovery and then we're going to challenge you a little bit harder than last time, right? And that is how you expand that window of tolerance. Um, That is how you get to that big presentation. That is how you get to that big athletic event and you do perform at your best. Um, cause yeah, uh, tomorrow may not be your day, but maybe three months from now with proper training. <laughs> right. And, and, and managers hear what we're saying, right? It's, it's that, that idea that, you know, and I, I think sometimes athletics uses military analogies, business uses athletic, and you know, we, 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 we sort of do these worlds, but you know, the autonomic nervous system is the autonomic nervous system. So you know, really helping people perform. And I I just, that recovery spot, you know, has hit athletics, especially elite athletes, because being as old as I am, we never, not one moment talked about recovery. We might have a day off every once in a while, but it wasn't like, this is what you need to do to maximize the fact that you don't have a practice or a game today. Uh, It's kind of like, well, let's, go out and party like because we don't have practice like you know it's let's stay up late like there there was no I'm just in that age group where if you didn't wake up and destroy yourself each and every day you must not be dedicated enough to your work and I still think in the work world and now you know just listening to the news all these layoffs that we see happening in the business world now you know that means it's going to fall on people. The the worker you had power for like five minutes. Now the corporation is going to be in charge. Is how do we build these environments that allow people to thrive? And then personally, how do we do that as well? So I want to I want to end this episode, Dave. I'm going to go to you first um, from the physical perspective on this, and feel free obviously to throw in any of the mental as well. 
is this idea of homeostasis is so important is, is how well am I able to recover from stress, stay in my window of tolerance, and now we've been in under this load of stress. So I almost think that a lot of people, and I'll let you, both of you correct me if I'm off here in my, my words, we've adapted to this high stress world in which we live, where there's always the threat of illness. And if you've got a young person or a teacher in your life, you know, how, how many different viruses are putting people in the hospital right now? Question mark. Uh, you know, you, you've got occupational, like I said, things switched around, political environments, you know, everything, war, all this stuff going on. Uh, we've had the biggest civil rights movement in my lifetime. Throw that in uh, to all the stress that people have experienced. So, so Dave, let me, let me try to ask something, uh, step out of my comfort zone here. So I'm always like this because I'm stressed out. And if you're not watching us on YouTube, I'm trying to be as lurchy as possible. My neck's tight. My back's tight. I, I'm just holding that stress. And that's almost become, in some ways, my new set point. I, do you have any thoughts? If I've been living in this stress for ye a few years now, just kind of what what are you seeing with that and, and where do we what might be the first step for somebody that's looking to say hey i can't go on like this i, I need to do something different but this is who i'm starting to be now this is who i wake up this is who i go to bed being i don't like it but but it's kind of where i'm finding myself what, what would be maybe some of the advice that you would give folks who just find themselves as, yeah, yeah, my cup's been full for three years now, and that's kind of who I am. That's my life. So, um, so that is that is very common, you know. Uh, but before the pandemic and everything, uh, you know, absolutely, there was a, a ton of people walking around like that, finding themselves in that position, and you know, tenfold more now. Yeah. Uh, so, absolutely, you know, it, it, we see that drift. Uh, of the shoulders coming up, we see the shoulders rounding forward, and uh, and and we call that a protective posture, right? Because uh, because if you're going if you're going to uh, if you're going to fight, right? What are you going to do? You're yeah. going to be you're going to be here, right? If you're um you know or or you're going back to fetal position, yeah. right? Uh, you can look at it like that as well. Um, you know you're you're curling back up. Um, so you know what 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 do we see aside from that so it's not just that you're going into this and you have some tight muscles and that's a problem um that's part of the problem because those tight muscles are using a whole bunch more energy than nice relaxed muscles so is this person fatigued at the end of the day is this person have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning yeah yeah absolutely um you know because those those muscles that are supposed to be relaxed right? They are, they are just expending energy like crazy. Um, we see that when you start to do this and you start to create this kind of a posture all the time that breaks down the way that your, your breathing can naturally happen. So your diaphragm can't function nearly as well when you're in this kind of a position, right? In that defensive kind of a posture. And as a result, you end up using accessory breathing muscles and what happens then? You know, more energy expenditure, more fatigue, and the less ability to replenish yourself. Um, so that is, it's just a continuing cycle, right? Uh, and that stresses you out even more. That builds inflammation. Uh, that makes it more likely that you are going to get disease, that you're going to develop some kind of chronic, uh, chronic illness. Um, all of these kinds of things. So what is, uh, what is the best first step for somebody like that to take? Um, breathe. <laughs> um, and, uh, and as, as easy and simple as that sounds, um, it, it really is, uh, you know, just, uh, starting, starting with breath work and, um, you know, and this is getting, um, you know, all into, uh, what, what our app does amazingly. And, uh, and a lot of Ina's work and everything as well, uh, throughout there, but, you know, doing what you can to reverse that posture, of course, consciously, whenever we can become aware of that, we can help to relax those muscles. We can do exercises to uh, to help come out of that, but that's only going to help to a point. We need to reset the autonomic nervous system. 
And resetting the autonomic nervous system is something that we can do with, uh, you know, with, with a lot of uh, tools lifestyle wise, but chiropractic is very powerful for that. Acupuncture is very powerful for that. Um, and of course, biofeedback is absolutely amazing for that. Um, and I, uh, and, and that's about where I want to uh, hand it off to Ina and her, right. her uh, talk about that. And I, uh, and, and of course I uh, address that issue itself too, but um. But that's where that's where I always start with is uh, is proper breathing, um, proper posture, exercises to come out of that, and anything we can do to help reset that autonomic nervous system. Awesome. Well, you know, you gave me a great handoff to kind of wrap us up. So, uh, what what are you helping? Because I'm sure you see this coming into uh, uh, your practice as well. So, uh, love love to get sort of your any suggestions you might have for folks that are finding themselves in this position. Well, I love Dave's answer. I think it covers most of, uh, you know, what I would suggest as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, the funny thing about fatigued muscles, uh, to echo what um, uh, Dave is talking about, is, you know, you would think that a tired muscle would be kind of more likely to relax. You'd think that it, want, it would want to relax, but fatigued muscles actually have a much harder time uh, releasing the tension, right? So when you find yourself walking around, you know, like this, you know, with your shoulders up, you know, at your ears and in that kind of protective uh, posture, uh, you might find that it's actually like you, you drop your shoulders down and you kind of do the right postural things. And as Dave said, it only goes so far because guess what? That tired muscle, even though you've released it, it's actually having trouble letting go. So the autonomic nervous system reset um, is really important. You need to give yourself pr um, much longer periods of time to recover uh, both, you know, longer periods of time for your muscles to release and just for your, uh, for your body um, to, uh, get out of that uh, chronic stress mode. Uh, so plenty of sleep, so important. And, you know, as much as I love biofeedback, right, uh, no amount of biofeedback is going to overcome not sleeping, right? So if you're not giving yourself, yeah, no, if you're not giving yourself enough time to sleep, start, start there. Uh, sleep, nutrition, um, biofeedback, uh, just doing fun things. Um, you know, all, all of that is, uh, is really, really important. And then just watching that mind body connection, right? When do your shoulders start going up? Like what happens, you know, what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your life? Um, you know, sometimes it's purely, you've been sitting at your desk too long. Um, it, it's just really physical. And other times there is a very, very strong emotional component that needs uh, uh, to be attended to both uh, in order to prevent this from happening in the future and in, in order to address uh, uh, the current issue, the emotional stuff needs to be addressed as much as the physical. Beautiful. Well, what a great episode to look at chapter one. So I, I want to leave it there because chapter two, we start to look at health and wellness with HRV. So so how do we start to quantify all of this? So if you just jumped in again, I really encourage you to go back and get full experience here with us. Um, and we are going to look at uh, chapter two next week. So that, that will be played as the audiobook chapter. And then uh, Dave and Ina and I will be back to, to look at that as well as my dog Moose has joined us. Uh, for those of you on video, she, she loves the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. So she had to get in here as well. But uh, Dave, Ina, thank you so much. Uh, I always learn so much from you all. And I really look forward to, to our next conversation. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Dave.